Um, I'll preface this, um, this paper with um, a slight caveat. It is uh, a work in progress. Um, I'd really welcome any uh, thoughts, criticisms, um, questions at the end. Um, it's hopefully going to end up in a um, multidisciplinary anthology, um, maybe in press next year on um, luxury and the senses, so um, a work in progress. It's easy to read the ancient accounts of aristocratic and imperial banquets in relatively simplistic terms. Their exercises in the explicit demonstration of power. The extreme wealth and or the elite social status of the host provides an opportunity for the manipulation or humiliation of the banquet guests. The sheer amount of food that is available on these occasions, combined with its exotic provenance, not only supplies a chance for the overt display of conspicuous consumption, but also allows for gluttonous ingestion. Such excess taps into familiar tropes of the traditional lack of restraint of tyrants and the perceived degeneration of the Roman world in a post-Carthage ethos. Moral collapse and the slide into decadence is demonstrated by cornucopian display on a massive scale. Authors from Sallust and Suetonius to Athenaeus and the author of the Historia Augusti regale their readers with outrageous anecdotes of the debauchery and dissipation of the plutocracy, frequently making explicit connections between intemperance at the dinner table and moral dissolution. The reputed frugality of the diet of Augustus is contrasted with the gluttony of Claudius or Vitellius. A delight in culinary exotica is often greeted with stern disapproval in imperial biographies. The taint of Eastern decadence attaches itself to those who indulge a little too freely at the dinner table or who are overly concerned with exotic or rare ingredients. Of course, as we are well aware, such accounts look to the tiny minority of ancient dietary experiences. A much simpler pattern of eating would have been the quotidian experience of vast swathes of the antique population, whose nutritional existence would have been substantially dictated by seasonality and the availability of foodstuffs. Limited resources must have meant that many would have had to survive for extended periods on dried or pickled produce. When thinking initially about this topic, I was drawn to comparisons that might be made with current dining practices. As a nation, we devour the television programs of celebrity chefs, and we ardently consume their recipe books. Yet many of us may only have a limited repertoire of a few dishes that we can successfully cook. And rising levels of obesity seem to point to a widespread lack of knowledge or lack of interest in issues of nutrition and culinary techniques. And yet, at the same time, we're fascinated by what has been termed molecular gastronomy. Practitioners such as Heston Blumenthal have popularized experimental techniques that seek to render meals less as an occasion for nutritional ingestion and more as a complete sensory experience. Sound, smell and texture are manipulated to render the meal a piece of theater, a culinary work of art. And in my abstract, um, I refer to this as a kind of gastronomic uh, Gesamtkunstwerk, in which environmental ambience, location, lighting, even eating utensils, occupy an equal importance to the food itself. Some have pointed to the expensive nature of these meals, which are frequently labor-intensive and combine sophisticated cooking techniques and costly equipment with rare ingredients, and to the relatively limited number of people who have access to them, Waiting lists for reservations can often be years long. And they've declared such meals as decadent, even obscene. This latter epithet is usually utilised by those who point to the existence of food banks in many UK towns or the poor quality of food enjoyed, and I use the word advisedly, by those on low incomes. Naturally, I wondered whether it may be possible to make any valid comparisons between these types of dining experiences and those elite ones that are described in our extant ancient sources. It struck me that there were certain accounts of imperial banquets in the Roman world that appear to share certain similarities with these modern gastronomic experiences. For this paper, I would like to briefly examine three examples through this prism. The black banquet of the Emperor Domitian, as described by Cassius Dio, the accounts of the feasts of the Emperor Elagabalus, and finally the fictional dinner given by the ex-slave Trimalchio in Petronius's Satyricon. I want to see whether we are able to reappraise these occasions 
modifying traditional interpretations of these events as evidence of cruelty and depravity, and to see them as attempts to render dining as a theatrical performance. Before I look at these accounts, I think it might be worth considering a text that was published almost a century ago that may assist us in our investigations. This is the Futurist Cookbook, first published in 1932, written by Filippo Marinetti. The Futurist Manifesto of 1909 had proclaimed the virtues and supremacy of speed, violence and technology, and the recipes contained within the cookbook sought to translate these philosophical ideals into a gastronomic context. According to the Futurists, the perfect meal consists of originality and environment, the use of food sculptures, and perfume and music to enhance tasting. And Heston Blumenthal is particularly fond of the enhancement of the culinary experience through the use of sounds and smells. The first Futurist dinner, given on the evening of the 8th of March 1931 at the Holy Palate restaurant in Turin, included dishes such as aero food, tactile with sounds and scents, which is described as follows. This course consists of four parts. On a plate are served one quarter of fennel bulb, an olive, a candied fruit, and a tactile device. The diner eats the olive, then the candied fruit, then the fennel. Contemporaneously, he delicately passes the tips of the index and middle fingers of his left hand over the rectangular device made of a swatch of red velvet and a tiny piece of sandpaper. From some, hid carefully, hidden from some carefully hidden melodious source comes the sound of part of a Wagnerian opera, and simultaneously, the nimblest and most grateful, graceful of the waiters sprays the air with perfume. <laughs> we have another dish called the excited pig, which was cooked salami, served immersed in a concentrated solution of strong black coffee and flavoured with eau de cologne. <laughs> and I think there's been various um, attempts to recreate these and um, with varying degrees of success. Now... It seems clear that Marinetti saw this unusual fusion of the senses in a, in a culinary context as an important and necessary artistic statement and in a way of refashioning an important facet of human existence. And something we do find in, in other futurist texts is the idea that, that food can actually be reduced down to, to pills, essentially, to, to get the, the nutritional element. I think we could usefully approach the ancient texts in a similar way, seeing less of the cruelty and sadism hinted at in the texts and more as evidence of an artistic sensibility lurking in the depths of the souls of even the most depraved and lunatic despot. So my first example will be the Emperor Domitian's infamous Black Banquet, and this is described by Cassius Dyer, and I'll just read this out to you. And on another occasion, he entertained the foremost men among the senators and knights in the following fashion. He prepared a room that was pitch black on every side, ceiling, walls, and floor, and had made ready bare couches of the same colour, resting on the uncovered floor. Then he invited in his guests, alone, at night, without their attendance. And first, he set beside each of them a slab, shaped like a gravestone, bearing the guest's name, and also a small lamp, such as hang in tombs. Next, comely naked boys, likewise painted black, entered like phantoms, and after encircling the guests, in an awe-inspiring dance, took up their stations at their feet. After this, all the things that are commonly offered at the sacrifices to departed spirits were likewise set before the guests, all of them black and in dishes of a similar colour. <laughs> Consequently, every single one of the guests feared and trembled and was kept in constant expectation of having his throat cut the next moment. The more so on the part of everyone but Domitian, there was dead silence, as if they were already in the realms of the dead, and the emperor himself conversed only upon topics relating to death and slaughter. Now, Catherine Edwards, um, in Death in Ancient Rome, has compared this account with later such funereal dinners as that featured in J.K. Huisman's novel, Arabor, or the dinner given in 1783 by the editor of Almanac des Gourmands, uh, Grimaud de la Both meals were so-called black dinners, the latter having a sarcophagus as a table centerpiece. So there appears to be sort of um, parallels um, going into the 18th century. It's tempting to see Domitian's meal as merely another example of the cruelty and paranoia of this particular ruler, particularly as the passage is preceded by numerous examples of executions carried out by his regime. However, the elaborate care taken to ensure the harmony of environment, 
food and atmosphere to create a particularly emotional effect in the diners surely displays some of the elements that we've seen from Marinetti. The aim of the dinner may have been to threaten and intimidate, but it was done with sardonic humour and with an eye for visual and dramatic effect. Domitian, stage or film director? It may seem outlandish to suggest such a thing, but both Suetonius and Cassius Dio point to a certain part of Domitian's character that was attracted to the new and unusual, as illustrated by his presentation of curious gladiatorial spectacles, such as the setting of dwarves and women in combat against each other. The boredom and paranoia of the sadistic autocrat results in a stunning piece of macabre theatre. If anything, my next example, I think, demonstrates the theatrical potential of the ancient banquet even better. It's the account given in a work called the Historia Augusti, of uh, the extravagant meals given by the young Emperor Elagabalus. Now, no one looks to this particular work for documentary evidence of the reign of this emperor, and like other historians, Herodian and Dio, it does paint a very negative picture of this ruler. <laughs> Nonetheless, the Historia Augusti does spend an inordinate amount of time on the, on the banquets that he threw. Now, time constraints today preclude an analysis of all the culinary activities, and there are, there are a very large number in this particular text. So one or two must uh, suffice to illustrate my thesis. So um, like Domitian, uh, Elagabalus seems to have enjoyed experimenting with colour at the table, so we're told. Um, also, he gave summer banquets in various colours. One day a green banquet, another day an iridescent one, and next in order a blue one, varying them continually every day of the summer. He's also very interested in originality at the dinner table. We're told he was the first to concoct wine seasoned with mastic, and with penny royal and all such mixtures which our present luxury retains. And rose wine, of which he had learned from others, he used to make more fragrant by adding pulverised pine cone. In fact, all these kinds of cups are not met with in books before the time of Elagabalus. Elagabalus is ruling beginning of the 3rd century AD. Indeed, for him, life was nothing except a search after pleasures. He was the first to make force meat of fish, or of oysters of various kinds, or similar shellfish, or of lobsters, crayfish, and squills. He also enjoyed putting on themed meals, we're told, that he had the custom, moreover, of asking to dinner eight bald men, or else eight one-eyed men, or eight men who suffered from gout, or eight deaf men, or eight men of dark complexions, or eight tall men, or again, eight fat men. And he also experimented with the experience of the food as a, as a trompe l'oeil. Um, we're told, so skillful were his confectioners and dairymen that all the various kinds of food that were served by his cooks, either meat cooks or fruit cooks, making them now out of confectionery or again out of milk products. His parasites, he would, the parasites are the sort of the people that accompanied him at the dining table, uh, he would serve with dinners made of glass and at times he would send to their table only embroidered napkins with pictures of the viands that were set before himself as many in number as the courses which he was to have, so that they were only served with representations made by the needle or the loom. Sometimes, however, paintings too were displayed to them, so that they were served with the whole dinner, as it were, but were all the while tormented by hunger. Now, it's unclear why the author of these passages, and numerous others on the subject of Elagabalus and food, and they do take up a rather large amount of, of the text space, why this author is so interested in the culinary exploits of Elagabalus? Because they are largely absent from the other accounts of the, this emperor's life in Dio and Herodian. Is this a particular interest on the part of the author? And there is a problem with um, this particular work. The authorship has been disputed somewhat by uh, scholars. Is there a in burgeoning interest in what we would term gastroporn on the part of the intended readership? The text may have intended such descriptions to demonstrate the frivolity and the wickedness of the emperor. Nonetheless, Elagabalus' meals were later to be lauded by the decadent movement of the late 19th century, as was Elagabalus himself, as <coughs> examples of a visionary artistic expression, a sensitive and artistic soul cruelly and ignominiously thwarted and persecuted by a Philistine Roman culture. Elagabalus' meals surely are not too distant, at least in spirit, from the creations of the exponents of molecular gastronomy or the recipes of Marinetti, certainly in their intent to create unique and boundary-pushing culinary experiences. Now, my final example does not purport to document reality, but is instead a fictionalised feast, that given by the ex-slave Trimalchio 
in the Satyricon of Petronius, written in the first century AD. This Roman ex a banquet par excellence is characterised by the vulgar buffoonery of the ex-slave host and the display of culinary eccentricities. Here is one example from the text. After our applause, the next course was brought in. Actually, it was not so grand as we expected, but it was so novel that everyone stared. It was a deep circular tray with the 12 signs of the zodiac arranged around the edge. Over each of them, the chef had placed some appropriately dainty, uh, appropriate dainty suggested by the subject. Over Aries the ram, chickpeas. Over Taurus the bull, a beefsteak. Over the heavenly twins, testicles and kidneys. Over Cancer, the crab, a garland. Over Leo the lion, an African fig. Over Virgo the virgin, a young sow's udder. Over Libra, the scales, a balance with a cheesecake in one pan and a pastry in the other. Over Scorpio, a sea scorpion. Over Sagittarius the Archer, a sea bream with eye spots. Over Capricorn, a lobster. Over Aquarius, the water carrier, a goose. Over Pisces, the fishes, two mullets. In the centre was a piece of grassy turf bearing a honeycomb. A young Egyptian slave carried around bread in a silver oven, and in a sickening voice he mangled a song from the show The Asafoetida Man. So once again, what we have is an emphasis on a preoccupation with mise-en-scene, Ingredients are assembled to create a, a tableau, and the visuals are enhanced with the provision of a musical soundtrack. The host has become the author of his own gastronomic narrative. Of course, in this work, such displays are a sign of the vulgarity and the nouveau riche status of Trimalchio, and thus may offer a condem condemnation of the foibles and excesses of the Neronian court. Nero, like Elagabalus, was derided and despised as an effeminate, whimsical despot espousing cultural values that seem to be the very antithesis of martial Roman virtues. Both rulers seem as far away as it could possibly be from the Cincinnatus archetype so revered by Roman thinkers and poets. A soldier's austere rations made for a dramatic contrast with the exotic fare on offer at the imperial convivium, and it may well have been seen as a mark of supreme degeneracy to be concerned with spending so much time, effort and money on such a transitory activity as eating, or on meals that could not actually be eaten. Yet, although in this case we may discern a power play of sorts on the part of the host, the assertion of his newly found social status, we may also see a delight in the power of display and performance, and an acknowledgement of the possibilities of the transformation of reality at the dinner table. Trimalchio may feel that money can buy anything, including respect, but it cannot be denied that the feast he has produced raises the meal to the level of magical spectacle, a kind of performance art. So, how might these examples provide a fresh way of looking at imperial banquets? It's true that the ancient authors generally use the occasions of imperial excess at the table as another way of castigating these rulers. In the 12th book of Athenaeus's Deipnos Sophistai, that's the, the philosophers at dinner, we are presented with numerous examples of gluttonous eastern tyrants a concern with perfumery, homosexuality or transsexuality, elaborate clothing and excessive food intake is viewed as a mark of indolence and corruption. Athenaeus' in inventory of tyrants includes such edifying figures as Dionysius of Heraclea, who was prone to choking on the folds of his own neck flesh produced by his extreme corpulence, and the Egyptian ruler Ptolemy VII, nicknamed Fat Belly. Roman examples include the overeating of the emperors Claudius and Vitellius, who we're told used emetics repeatedly to enable them to consume excessive amounts of food. The examples here in this paper seem to conform to such stereotypes, and yet, if we can step outside this context and view these banquets not simply as events that go against traditional Roman concepts of self-identity, and see how they've influenced both previous generations and our own, we may choose to reject these descriptions simply as a mark of the other in Roman eyes, We've largely, I think nowadays, jettisoned the, the strictures of traditional notions of masculinity that seems to have constrained the, the Roman male aristocrat. And we're less inclined to treat the possession of artistic taste as something that is effeminate or degenerate. Um, they can be viewed in numerous ways as foreshadowing many of the gastronomic trends that we see today. Of course, some of you here today may view the current trend for such cuisine in, in a similar way to some of the Roman moralizers uh, as a sign of uh, debut de siècle uh, decadence. However, I like to think that were Elagabalus able to cast his eye over the tasting menu of the fat duck, he would allow himself a quiet smile of approval and then would have everybody killed in bizarre ways. Thank you.
five, ten minutes for questions, comments. Standing in the silence. Uh, thank you, that was very good. I <coughs> Just towards the end there, you talk, said about the transformation of reality. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, because of course, alcohol is a transformative substance, and of course, a variety of uh, other herbs and other things are also transformative. Um, and what about the role of uh, alcohol or, or other forms or substances that again create a slightly separate reality and distance the, uh, the special feast from Sort of other normal there is. The texts do talk about alcohol in various contexts. Um, the one that springs to mind, though, is um, is the castigation of heavy drinkers, for instance. Um, the most notable example I can think of is um, Cicero's extended attack on Mark Antony in the Philippics, um, which takes every opportunity to complain about Mark Antony's constant drunkenness, vomiting when he's hung over, uh, appearing in the Senate House drunk. So. Um, there's an element of um, criticism of people who can't hold their drink or drink affecting their public duties. And, and in the Greek world, um, there are, are generally very strict rules about how wine is taken in, in a symposium. So there is a symposiarch who controls what people drink. So he sets the pace. So in fact, actually, um, alcohol seems to be something that isn't necessarily included as a transfer transforming experience. It's, it's more about um, the types of food and the sheer excess of food that fits in. But. There's an interesting parallel between the, the uh, uh, food as, as spectacle, uh, pleasant or unpleasant, that his uh, uh, underlings were subjected to, and what the vast majority of television viewers today find uh, in the gastro porn of, of, of the foods to look at but but, to, but not to consume only in this case done voluntarily yes that's very true yes that's very true we are subjecting ourselves to this kind of hunger and this distance from food um, it's an interesting phenomenon gastro porn and the idea of you know, taking pictures of food and posting on social media is yeah it's interesting Thank you. I really enjoyed your paper. Um, I also enjoyed the comparison to the Futures Cookbook, and I like that. Um, that's very, very useful, I think. Um, and particularly because I want to ask, uh, because we have a literary representation of, of the events and then the actual kind of social level of what the social norms were. So I, was, I wanted you to say a little bit more about um, how the aesthetics of the, the spectacle of the performance uh, are what is determining or allowing the transgression of the social norms to um, occur. And then how much of that is also literary performance in the text that you're... Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Um, thank you. Um, I suppose part of it is, is thinking about the reach of this, these texts, who they're aimed at, how, who's reading them. Um, there is some dispute about um, some of the authorship of the, the Historia Augusti. Um, it's quite late, though, um, so it's looking back. Um, I think, on the whole, um, what we're getting is, is elite accounts um, of these events directed at probably an elite readership. So, um, <coughs> certainly, um, there is an op a, a preoccupation with, with this culture of excess going all the way back to the late Republic when we start getting lots of stories about um, fish farms, massive fish farms being built in the, the, the south of Italy. Um, and that's, ta that's linked with um, moralising writers talking about how everybody's become degenerate and then that's when we start getting um, sumptuary legislation coming in that fails repeatedly until it's just given up. So I suspect if we were to find graffiti that's, that's, that's referring to these things, then we're talking about a wide readership. But I'm just unclear at the moment about who's getting access to these texts. Um, it could just be a very restricted audience, in which case it is aristocrats, it's the Senate, it's, it's the aristocracy. Thank you. Between 
sound, taste, uh, texture, and, and ruptures. Mm. Trying to evoke a, a rupture in time and space. Is there something equivalent to that in the uh, Roman cases you're citing? Um, yes, and I think I think that the element is I think it's humour. I think it's 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 almost like practical jokes. I think that's. Mm. I mean, Marinetti is is there to shake people up. I mean, mm. those of you who are familiar with the futurists. I know that they're talking about disrupting, they're talking about um, shaking people out of familiar thought patterns, um, and they are there to shock and, and, and wake people up, as it were. And I think there's a certain element of that, certainly in Elagabalus's meals. Um, it's unclear whether that's a result of boredom or whether, as the text seems to indicate, he's fascinated by originality. But I think certainly um, the idea of um, breaking norms because they can because the emperors are in a position to be able to ignore traditional morality. And if anybody has ever read anything about Elagabalus, and he's, he's undergoing a bit of a, 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 a sort of re-looking at um, the way that he's been portrayed in, in scholarship, he's a fascinating character. He's this teenage Syrian um, emperor who lasts for four years. Um, he's uh, flamboyantly bisexual. Um, he tries to change the, the gods. Uh, the stories about him are just incredible. Um, and it's clear that why the, the 19th century um, uh, aesthetic movement really kind of took him under their wing because he's, I'll just, uh, just go out and read the, the biographies of Elagabalus. That's, um, yeah, very, very uh, eye-opening stuff. So. Okay, we'll take one final question at the back. Okay, I wanted to say for East Asia, there are certainly some pretty exotic things that people eat. But it's more as medicine than food. Right. And there's the rationalization of chi. Uh, I mean, if somebody has to eat rhinoceros meat, it's because a rhinoceros has a lot of chi. And right. you, want to, you want to have it pass on. And so when I read Athenaeus, I, I, was, I keep thinking, how would this be formulated if it were an East Asian book? And the answer is pretty dull, I, I right. think. It, it would just, they, everything would be rationalized and, and, and so on. But that, that yes. was a comment. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your questions and your comments.